Could you move a bit closer to, uh, to us? take any more of your time. I'm going to get some coffee. Uh, but I would like to introduce Steph de Pape. Yeah. Okay. I have to speak in the mic because apparently it's a uh, live stream, this session, so that's uh, uh, new for me. I put my nice shirt on to live stream also. <laughs> so welcome also to people who follow the live stream. Um, first I want to thank uh, the committee and Kitten Kohlstadt for inviting me, of course, because otherwise I couldn't be here. We have sent in a performance, though, but it wasn't selected, so... But anyway, <laughs> so I think it, this is the second prize you can win, I think, you can speak. So, um, I've prepared a lecture which, is, which I will do for the first time, so you'll have to, excuse me, I have to read sometimes, so I'll try to be... There's someone having a heart attack, no? No? Okay, no, no, she's just pointing for that. <laughs> so, um, yes, I'll have to read some, some of the things. So I will talk more or less for uh, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on the number of jokes I will invent during the <laughs> reading. Um, and I'll try to structure the lecture um, in more or less four uh, parts. So it's about imagining the future, confronting the present, but more specifically, 
using new technologies in the visual theater. So our theater is a visual theater. We were uh, formerly a, a, a mere puppet theater, uh, but we are trying to open it up to, towards a more visual range of uh, possibilities. Uh, I must nuance a little bit the new technology. It's rather, I would talk rather about crappy technology, low technology, but you, you'll see. So the first part is uh, it's an introduction about the growing importance of art in a digitalized uh, surrounding, and because we live, of course, in a very technological society. That's not new, of course. That's a bit preaching for the choir, because you all know that. But still, I, I have some statements to make, which we can discuss in the Q&A later. I ask, did I say you? So 40 minutes and then 20 minutes Q&A. So be prepared. <laughs> Take a pen for that. Uh, secondly, I would like to focus on how so the first one is uh, the introduction. Secondly, how technological application can instigate new formats in theater. It's a bit of a big title for something very uh, simple I will talk to you about. And then third, third part is how technologies define dram dram dramaturgy and our lecture of performances. That's, I think we have to discuss about that later on because I think it's important and interesting. And then last but not least, if we still have the time, I will show you or showcase you some of uh, our performances who deal with uh, the, 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 how is it called? Futuristic imagination. <coughs> One is an adaptation of The Tempest uh, made by Joost van der Kasteel. He's a young, uh, young person, he's a young author and director. And then we have also Planet Nivanir, not from here. And that's a bit of a sort of a, uh, reversed kind of thing because it's it's two aliens who talk about human people. So that's it's a quite an awkward uh, uh, reversing of perspective. So let's start with, uh, yeah, in between I will try to show you some hopefully inspiring uh, pictures, kind of visual essay, which makes you think and not listen to me the whole time. <laughs> so uh, I had a joke here, but I won't tell it. It's, it's, it's not too good. <laughs> How do you look? <laughs> it's for later, later on. Later on. Wasn't a bad joke, so. How do we look at relics in the future? That could be the title of this uh, inspiring image. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's, let's start with uh, this one. It's perhaps an inspiring thing. I'll read it. I don't know if you behind can read it, but I'll read it. In the morning paper, I can read the weather report as well as a stock quotes. But when I look at out of my window, I only get a weather update and no stock exchange info. Could someone please fix this bug in my environmental system? <laughs> Thanks. I think it's quite uh, interesting because we have to realize that uh, the Generation Z, the sort of digital natives who are born now, they look quite reversed at things. And we, we don't always know that, but still when we're making theater, we, we tend to forget these things. It, remind, it reminds me also of a baby swiping a television, like using its iPhone <laughs> after six months already, yeah. that kind of stuff. So um, their state of mind functions often quite differently. Uh, so I'll come back to this matter when we talk about how technology or digitalization, difficult term, digitalization, affects our modes of reading a performance and, and, and the inherent dramaturgy. So, the introduction was the importance of art in a technological society. I will do this via two statements. I will first zoom in a bit, or zoom, zoom out a bit, <laughs> and then I'll come to my point. Blah, blah, blah. Um, the growing importance of art. The world we live in, actually, and that's also something we know, but the algorithm like Facebook and all the others, Snapchat and, and, uh, and, and so on, they constantly confirm ourselves and our world of living. That means that our world is shrinking enormously, of course. And we're all aware of that, again, we're all aware of that. But still, in that kind of uh, situation, uh, the art, what we try to do, is really growing in importance, I think, because art should not confirm our living world or our living circumstances. Um, so I think the importance, especially when you work for, for theater, in a theater for young audiences, um, you have to look for other horizons. And then looking for other horizons, the art, of course, 
becomes inside the physics subversive, or it should be. It's not confronting, disrupting, and discomforting. It challenges you, it provokes thought and emotion. Um, I must say, of course, I talk about TYA starting from six, seven years old. Of course, you don't, uh, it's difficult to, to disrupt babies, I think, or uh, uh, children of three years old. But still, we can just discuss about that. For instance, we abolished the term family show uh, in our language, in our rhetoric, because the term family also contains like, oh, it's comfortable on Sunday afternoon and cake with it. It's not forbidden, of course, it's nice, and we do that kind of things too, but on the other hand, we have to be aware that the context where we're living, uh, you, can, you, can, you can confront uh, children with, with uh, horrible things, I think, uh, not horrible things, but, but things that discomfort them. So I will talk through, I, I, I will explain that a bit later on. Uh, when I come to the performance, I will uh, case study with you. Little Red Eve, it's called. Because the, when you're in a state of uneasiness, you start to think also, as Fernando Pessoa said, that, that what in me uh, feels thinks, or that what in me thinks feels, so there's no distinction between feeling and thinking. That's, um, that's also, by the way, the premises of the, the theater of Brecht, so you have to not only undergo or experience it, but also like trying to, to get out of the bubble, let's say. Art can do that, so that's um, why art is ringing with the technical uh, society and without friction, of course, no brilliance or shimmering. So that's the first statement. Uh, let's not be too comfortable. We can discuss about that because, of course, we had this discussion also a bit in, the, in, the, in South Africa two years ago during the national gathering. And of course, our European context is another uh, context. When you talk about this discomfort in South Africa, it's completely different, of course, because the, the notion danger is daily uh, in the streets there. So that's another discussion, of course. So it's a bit, uh, perhaps, a, a European point of view. We can also discuss about that. Um, the second statement that emphasizes the importance of art in the techno technological context, and I use here for the observation of the Dutch professor, Erik Scherber. I don't know if you ever heard about him, Erik Scherber. He's also the guy, yeah. <laughs> Jace knows him, he's from, from Holland. He's also the guy who says, uh, don't sit down too long, so I s suggest that you all rise, and then, well, that's one of the bad words. <laughs> So uh, you have to move at least half an hour continuously because otherwise the body gets like, yeah, uh, sorry, you know, sorry, or you risk a disease. So what he says is the next thing, flexible brains, please. And we're talking about TYA now, young people, young kids. The brain needs to be stimulated and these stimuli, 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 come from the outside. Art relies upon creativity and it's unique in this. That has been researched, experienced, with large groups of people. You can obtain the creative effect most effectively by art. Art is a unique combination of peace, ideas, being socially involved or on your own. To be immersed in something in combination with feeling emotional. The first 25 years of a human life are vital. Very important, I think. If you propose a child a lot of experiences and stimuli, the brain builds more synapses, contact points. The more synapses, the more complex the brain becomes and the more flexible. So that's another, that's a bit of, I don't like most of the time people who tend to instrumentalize art because this is what Eric Scherer does, of course. It's art as an instrument against um, uh, uh, old age, actually, he says. If you build in flexible brains, you, you won't get Alzheimer's. Uh, Soon. It's not guaranteed, but it's mm -hmm. one of the exercises. I'm feeling a bit Alzheimer-ish now, but um, anyway. Um, next page. I've already mixed up a few. <coughs> Preparing, reading a lecture outside, so I messed up a paper. Sorry for that. Um, so uh, that's already said. Yes. So uh, yeah, he also says uh, our kids will need flexible brains because they will have to execute eleven jobs in the future that will become more and more technological. Of course, eleven jobs of which we don't even know the name or the existence. So. 
I must say, I was quite astonished by reading, of course, we know somewhere all of that, but when he points really the, the, the scientific, on a scientific level to what art can provoke in these young brains, it's quite, quite uh, astonishing, actually. Uh, an example of, an, of a possible job is this. So in the future, perhaps we don't speak about come and paint our wall. The painter, we have to call the painter. No, it will be a sort of, uh, how do you call it, software designer of wallpaper or something. That could be one job our children <coughs> could execute. And then probably five years later, there's another technology. They have to study again and find another job. That's the world that's coming ahead of us. So we better get prepared. And art can be very essential in this uh, kind of situation. So, OK, are there any questions already? Watch the time. Okay. No? <laughs> good. <laughs> or not good. Or so. um, okay, let's go to the heart of the matter now the performances. Uh, this is a trailer. Hopefully, it fades. It was performing outside, but. New technology. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I don't see there's no sound back on the trailer. <clears throat> oh, that's too bad. Luckily, I have still some pictures. Luckily, I have still some pictures. How could it? Oh, that's easier. Go with me, though. I'll show you some pictures first. Then. So this is the the performance I'd like to uh, uh, case study with you is um, Little Red Eve a performance I made in 2014 for the Mime for the Image Foundry the Mime my company. If you see these images, I don't know whether it rings a bell. Of course, it does ring. They know it, right? Hmm. Yeah, there's another trailer hidden under the. I don't know how could it still be. Can switch on. You go, can go via internet, perhaps. But no, the technician is not in the room. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, when you see these pictures, does it ring a bell? Do you know what kind of story this would be or could be? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, Little Red Riding Hood, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, first I want to make a sort of historical digression before we go to Little Red Riding Hood. Well, get a point, get the next lecture. <laughs> um, so, technology is a new magic. Uh, sometimes we hear that statement, or most of the time you hear, wow, technology, let's don't do that in theater because it's cold and it's killing poetry, etc., all these cliches. But we must realize that technology has always influenced the theater. Think of the uh, gaslight that abolished the candles, which were too dangerous in the, in the 19th century, for instance, or the fascination for the Pepper's Ghost, which was the first kind of hologram also in the 19th century. There were entire performances dedicated to the principle of the Pepper's Ghost. Or even earlier, the so-called uh, Théâtre à l'Italien, so the horseshoe-shaped theaters. Um, they were in the 17th, 18th century adapted because uh, theater makers at that time wanted to adapt uh, adventurous novels which were very popular at that time. So it's, a, it's an ongoing story technology in theater. Um, but first we have to define before we go to Little Red Eve or Little, Little Red Riding Hood, um, what is technology and what do we speak of now in these times when we speak about technology? Um, Basically, it's everything, of course. It's a screen, it's a camera, it's the audio headphones. Even my glasses are a form of technology because it's a prosthesis to watch the audience. <laughs> um, but also games, of course, and parabolic mega screens that fill a whole movie theater or domes that simulate a whole world. I have some pictures of that that get behind. Ta -da. Ah, is Hawkeye back? Yeah, I, I, ah, yeah. I have. Okay, that's good. Um, so, uh, what I tried to do in Little Red Eve, based on Little uh, Red Riding Hood, uh, was uh, mixing the, the, the craftsmanship of puppets with technology. 
which ended in a mixture of, in a mixture of the, the use of cameras, projections, microphones, headphones, and miniature worlds. So, why did I decide to use technology? It was not a decision, actually. It was a kind of necessity. Because what I wanted to do was um, uh, telling a story for kids uh, from seven years old, I think, and then youngsters and adults on the other hand, but two different stories based on the same content. So, the Little Red Riding Hood story, everyone knows, of course, because it's a story about the Little Red Riding Hood visiting her uh, grandma, and uh, it was eaten by the wolf and the grandma also. The symbolical underlying uh, content of Little Red Riding Hood is, of course, beware of the man, because the wolf is a man, of course, behind the trees who can uh, reach at you. So, as you all know, in Belgium, that was in 2014, we still have a kind of post-trauma of the Dutroux uh, thing. You know Dutroux, the famous pedophile uh, who is still in jail, I hope. Um, so I wanted to make a performance which is really relevant uh, at that time, but trying to, to mix two kinds of stories. In order to do that, I only could use technology because the people, so the youngsters and the, or the children and the, the adults, they saw the same performance, but they heard a completely different story, which was, of course, quite discomforting, because yeah. imagine that I, I have two sons, not daughters, but then I'm sitting next to my daughter and I hear this kind of strange, evolving story about a pedophile trying to lure uh, a young girl. That's, uh, I, had a, I had a lot of questions after the performance. What did they hear? What did the, what did the children hear? <laughs> and they heard a completely different story, which was quite humorous, actually, and quite funny. So you had a strange situation that in the, in the m most tension moments, the children started to laugh. Uh, the, the adults said, but strange, they, they laughed at the best. It's, so I had to try to build in some danger uh, in, the, in the performance, which was um, uh, a bit of the, uh, the aim to... to try to hit this story. So, um, why do I tell this? Because I think if you use technology pure as a technique or as a gadget, it won't function or people will very easily look through it. If you try to make it a necessity in order to realize your, your performance, then it's, I, I hope, <laughs> a, b a better way of dealing with, with this kind of technology. Again, technology, low technology, uh, headphones are very good. Hello, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Just need internet if that's possible. Internet. Yes, and sound. Yeah. And sound. Ah, we can sound. That's also great. Yes, thank you. Okay. And then, uh, what's the other one? This is this is by the way. This is by the way. Spannend. Het zijn toch vloekverhalen? Het is zo saai. Je weet toch wat er gaat gebeuren en je weet hoe het gaat aflopen. heeft mij willen opvoeden tot een man die de rechte paden bewandelt. Maandagavond stond ik te wachten op de tram van half zeven. Er stond een meisje in het wachthoek. Als de tram stopte en ik de deur open deed om haar te laten voorgaan, liet ze iets vaags rond haar bol spelen. Ik denk dat ze daarmee denken bedoelde. In de tram keek het meisje opnieuw naar mij met een gestoren blik. Het was dan dat ik voor de eerste keer de grijs-groene bloemetjes ontdekte die in haar ogen vielen. Petit fleuke, denk ik meteen. Oh, zeg, waarom zit jij zo laat? Ik heb een afspraak. Ik ben dran was te laat. Ja, ja, dat zal wel. Met wie? Zeg ik niet. Oké. Okay. Zonder reden, Betty. Mijn meneer van op tram. Hmm. Een leuke meneer. Hoe staan zijn wenksprouwen? Wat bedoelt je? Hoe staan zijn wenksbrauwen, Eva? Zijn ze dicht gegroeid? Ja, niet op gelet, hè, mama. Ze moeten van met de wenksbrauwen zijn dicht gegroeid. Je mocht niet vertrouwen, Eva, dat weet je toch? Je mocht dit niet, je mocht dat niet. Je ah, moet oppassen, anders ga je in dat bos in gaten. Ja. Hoe weet je het? Eva? 
maar ze noemde mij kleine rode Eva. Maar gesprekken die beginnen met namen noemen, lopen slecht af. Schoon. Nog een oorspronkelijk ook. Je gaat je niet mee het bos in. En als we dan verdwalen? Ik weet de weg. Ah ja, daar heb ik wel meer vrouwen over zeggen. En als we dan honger krijgen? Mijn rugzak zit vol eten. Eigenlijk voor de bobbel. De bobbel? Check. Ja. Die woont aan de rand van de stad. Alleen? Mm-hmm. Check. Yo, yo, meneer. Lust dus een keer. Hier ben ik weer. Kop een wafel of hou snavel. Dat kan ik niks verkopen. Zet ik op een loop. Mijn ma wordt boos. Geen boterhammen in mijn boterhammen doos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Geld geef ik af. What I wanted to make was a, a kind of live animated movie and thus the use of cameras film, filming also miniature world. So you saw the miniature on stage, but it was also film. So a, a film of which you had the soundtrack in your ears. Mm. That was a bit the, the, the aim. I must say it was wonderful. Uh, I had a wonderful team, by the way, young people. And uh, it <laughs> was a bit of hell of a lot making it because sometimes they said, are we working for the adults now or for the children? Like, what are we doing now? Are we doing? So we get mixed up ourselves uh, during the performance. What the audience didn't know also was that some scenes were syn- synchronized. So they heard some scenes, uh, they heard the same thing. So in my memory, there was, there was seldom a performance of which the uh, parents and the kids talked so much afterwards to perform because they were exchanging experience, of course. And what was also funny, it was that you saw one image there with uh, the, the Playboy puppies, the, the, the rabbits, which was a bit of a dairy image, of course. And then when you ask children, what did you see? They all say, rabbits, wonderful rabbits. That's all that they see. <laughs> of course, the elves had a, a slightly different interpretation. Of that. <laughs> so um, another thing I want to talk about is that thanks to the headphones, um, or the headphones help to install a certain climate of forbidden intimacy, which was also one of the topics, of course, of the of the performance, because you really have that close the, the voices in your in your ear, which, by the way, was difficult for the actors because they couldn't speak out loud too much. We also had to train that quite a lot. <laughs> um, but that's another example of that where technology can add something or can bring something to the performance, which is quite which in this case was quite vital to the performance. Um, we also, by the way, experienced with uh, the venue, so we made a, a small kind of venue because I noticed when I was like standing fi- 50 meters behind, you didn't really, because in your ear you had it very close and then when you saw it, it was too far, so that wasn't possible, so we had to limit the capacity also of the, of the people. Quite a, quite a thing, actually. Okay. Um, perhaps you noticed also in the in the trailer the use of uh, video puppets. That's of course on the stage because otherwise it wouldn't be fair. An idea lended by the famous act, uh, uh, um, artist Tony Orthrop. I don't know if you know the name. He's one of the the eclectic artists of the 60s, 70s, 80s who made these uh, projections on balloons and every kind of different surfaces. He was the first to do that, so that helped. And the dying of the grandma, because she dies, she has lupus. In the performance, she has lupus. <laughs> yes, lupus. Um, <laughs> uh, it was actually a balloon that just went up to the sky, so, and then the image was gone. That was her death. Okay, so um, there are, of course, other means of using 
do a show on the pool. Uh, other means of uh, using, the, no time for jokes anymore. Um, <laughs> using technology in the field of visual theater. I'll show you some examples of another performance. That's a very iconical, that's not a performance, that's just a visual essay. That's Lara Croft, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about games and toys. It's Brawl Stars now, it's very popular. So yeah, this this when we had the technological uh, minor problem. So we traveled thousands of miles to indulge in a nature experience with an airplane, not so good. Or we stay at home and settle for a simulation. You can't imagine that, but so they build a whole dome. I can't remember where exactly in Germany. Berlin. Outside of Berlin. Yeah. Outside of Berlin. Exactly. Germany. Did you, you've been there? No. No. Okay. You want to go there? No. <laughs> Really? Yeah. And how was okay? Is that okay with the audio for the recordings? Can yeah, I ask? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you speak out loud? Yeah, just yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing, uh, you know, extraordinary. It's just it's weird. Come in and you feel that the temperature just went up 15 degrees, then you're like, oh, okay, it's warm, and you go swimming, and then you go eat, and then you go out, and then you're in Berlin again. So it's like time travel. Exactly. But, and do you forget that it's this art completely artificial simulated surrounding or? Uh, no, because you look up and there's like just a building. Yeah. It, okay. it is like the blue sky, like in the, in the Jim Carrey movie, the, yeah. the act, you know. Uh, the the, 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 the Truman Show. Yeah. 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 That would be a cool question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's nothing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah, that's also ahead of us. Well, that's existing already, of course. It's kind of, okay. Uh, so I'll show you another performance is um, Why the Child is Cooking in the Polenta, another very optimistic title. Uh, <laughs> actually very dark company doing very awkward shows. No, no, that's not true. So it's, uh, it was a circus kind of uh, um, performance. This is a good example. There's an actress inside of the, of the, the big ball, let's say, and there's text projection as, and other things were happening. I just mentioned that it's just it's just an example, but uh, what I want to talk to you talk to you about is how technology offers a possibility of bringing a new kind of consciousness of what is possible to present uh, to youngsters these days, and how that influences our dramaturgy. A popular narrative today, of course, is uh, that what the one who is presented by games. We all know that, of course, but uh, so a bit like the 18th century uh, novels. Uh, were influencing the staging, we could draw a parallel to games today, a popular genre. What happens on a dramaturgical level in a game? It works by triggers most of the time, so you go over something and then suddenly a door is opened or, or, or a secret lock is unlocked, etc. And it often, often works by mere association, so you walk through a world that is evoked and in which uh, things are triggered, as I said. So rather than following a story from A to B to C, Z, or A to uh, D and then etc., um, we don't follow characters throughout a, a fixed storyline, even if the story is told reversely, it's, it's a totally different principle. So, and also we go from level to level to level, and that's also something I became aware of when I saw my sons playing. You have to... Uh, um, to, to gain something, you have to perform well, you have to earn something in order to get to the next level. So on an unconscious level, this is frightening actually, because it's like, uh, again, confirming our meritocracy we live in. <laughs> so that's a kind of neoliberal kind of political principle, which is confirmed by playing, because you have to perform, then you can go to the next level. So the stress and the, the, the level of, you have to, is already installed in these brains of these young people. Of course, games have other advantages, because on a rhetorical level, and even thinking, so there's some advantages too, but on an unconscious level, <laughs> I get sometimes frightened. Um, but so games, games are structuring, games structures are defined by those elements I mentioned. And this narrative, I think, is influencing the way uh, youngsters decode uh, performances especially when they, get, uh, when they grow older, of course. So it's not, I go from image to image to image or from sentence to sentence to sentence and I follow a story, even if it's told uh, backwards. 
No, it's, it's the whole thing, the whole time. So the, the, the kind of simultaneously they cope with is enormous. So what I tried to do in this performance was really sort of throw it into the public, <laughs> like text projections, uh, uh, images, uh, there was a silent clown also doing things, so uh, an extreme degree of simultaneity. And then a lot of programmers, uh, which are, or most of them are middle-aged like myself, so no, uh, no pun intended, no insult. And they said, yeah, it's a nice performance, but it's a bit too much, too much, too much, too much. I must say, I never heard this critique from young people because they never say it's too much, because they live in a world that is too much the whole time. <laughs> so, and that's not even, Again, confirming their 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 image, but still, it's it's a way of, of dealing with the performance. So this is kind of question also to the audience who are all leaving now. So I should shut down. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to a big toilet break. Um, so I think there is a new kind of consciousness we have to be aware of as a maker that the degree of possibility and throwing elements on the stage is be, has become, I think, much larger than than before. Um, so let's not be afraid of making performances that perturbate or uh, install at first sight incomprehensible paradoxes. And not only on a content level, but really uh, uh, in the living environment we create in the imaginative world. Okay, so just some last, uh, these are yeah, images of the, this, this was the actress inside of the, of the bowl and there were projections uh, and she was singing actually, she was an opera singer, so it was kind of strange strange kind of image. Um, that was also an image, we build a, a kind of prophet of three meters and a half. Mm -hmm. So you get, so the second, it was based on a book actually in three parts, and the second part was playing in a, in a school with a very severe uh, director, and she was the, the head of the school, of course, three meters and five high. Uh, so we had a kind of uh, Alice in Wonderland feeling. The last thing, just, by, just very quickly. So it's not down in any map, two places never are. It's a beautiful quote by Herman Melville, what is it? Uh, so I told you already in the beginning, we did also uh, a performance called The Storm, which is, I, that's, is it everything else? The Storm. Uh, the Tempest. The Tempest, yeah, but it's, it's made after the, te the title. So it's not The Storm, but The Beast. That was act, yeah, yes. Invade, yes, Invade, that's it. Uh, so, and that was, you know, all know the story, probably it's based on an island. Well, Joost Kamikasero made the performance based on a planet, but not an entirely new idea because it was, there is a movie, Forbidden Planet, I don't know if you know it, <coughs> and from the 60s, I think, it's a very awkward movie, it really, it's very nice to see, with Robbie the Robot. <laughs> um, and so, he made a performance where the imaginative was kind of futuristic, and it worked wonderful. Uh, there is also, of course, the, the movie uh, Black Panther, with uh, Wakanda, the, the new uh, uh, African kind of village or, or city, let's say, it was completely futuristic, where the, the white uh, people don't have anything to say anymore. It's a beautiful movie, I think it's an action movie, but it's also based on actually a sort of brotherly uh, quarrel, so it's a far uh, echo of Shakespeare also. Um, so, uh, I think we live in a time of science fiction. It was before a bit of a niche, but everything is shifting so rapidly because of science that takes quantum leaps, altering our regular paradigmas in a dazzling way. So it's now become, I think, a cultural force, and it works very well with children, and not only with boys. The, the, the girls are already also fascinated. So something triggers in their imagination when you use this futuristic kind of imaginative. Um, so you can say we have to make a world that is based on scientists and not on ruled by politicians because all our problems are scientific, not politic, not uh, yeah, political. I mean, uh, and also there is of course this famous uh, example of the the Back to the Future. In Back to the Future, I don't know if you remember, there is this tablet used. In, uh, the, the movie dates from '85, so and Apple came with the iPad in 2010, so 25 years later. So. That's also a force we have, I think. E even on the stage, <laughs> I think it's pretty boring, it's a bit too much, <laughs> <laughs> I have to conclude. <laughs> even on the stage, um, uh, you can really try to invent some kind of new formulas or new kind of imaginative which are, which are, because you really have to invent everything when you work with a futuristic imaginative, of course, because it doesn't exist. 
towards the end unknown is literally what is uh, happening when one's on stage. So yes, uh, that's enough. And I, I will conclude with another. Yeah, yeah. That's a trailer, but I will prefer to have a QA. and a Ah, yeah, that's perhaps an interesting thing. So what was before a planet, yeah, because it's situated on a planet, became at a certain moment the monster Taliban. And the monster Taliban was created by two huge legs and then someone behind a desk who was filmed and made a kind of spaghetti. So his head was called a spaghetti head, <laughs> which is a very beautiful image, I thought, uh, invented by the, by the makers. So it's, and it's quite simple actually, just uh, spaghetti and three tomatoes and you have a face. So it's, it's very, it's also very futuristic. So you can use low technology as said. So that's the last one, Planet Ivanir, and that's what I said. It's about two uh, aliens who come and observe humanity, and I'll show you the last. Uh, oh, no, that's not the one. Op zich is de aarde een planeetje van niks waar wij nog over te vertellen valt. Maar toen ontdekten wij dat planeet aarde gecontroleerd overhoekerd is door één aliensoort die zichzelf... Tijd vier! De mens kan geluid omzetten in beweging. Humans got talent. <laughs> the humans got talent, and that's now for you to show. <laughs> so that was that was that. So a bit of an overview of uh, the five years trails we followed at the Alpha Demand. So if you have any questions, um, uh, let's have a bit of a discussion. The ones okay, who are staying. Are you finished now? Yes, you finished. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> And also thank you for the for the live viewers uh, of the live stream. Thank you. Okay. So if there are any questions, I don't know. It's a bit of a yes. Just one question because we were talking about the video games aesthetics and how that uh, like uh, that the children already have a lot of impressions at the same time, mm -hmm. and you said you use that also as a strategy in the performance. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that it's important to go like with their world, their aesthetically world, or to challenge it? Yes, oh, that's no, a very okay. good question. I think both. Because the performers I talked to the, while the child was talking, it was uh, Cooking in Polenta, had uh, into the, the enormous simultaneity some moments w which were very concentrated where the story really had to be told. So of course you try to, to uh, I don't, if I understand your question very well because what I said was perhaps a bit too consumeristic. You don't have to, to go with them because you're confirming them again, of mm -hmm. course. But I, it's more like a sort of form or you, the, the margin in which you can do some, some or the, 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 I rephrase that, the dramaturgical strategies you can um, uh, deploy on a stage and the variety of it are much broader, I think, than, than before, perhaps because they were used at the classical fairy tales where we saw some edges there. So that the range has become bigger without confirming them the whole time, of course, because then they could better stay at home and play their games, of course. Mm -hmm. And then also, of course, within this variety, you can uh, tell a certain content, which is probably different than in games, I think. But it's a question we also ask uh, ourselves uh, the whole time, actually. So <laughs> where do we go to and how far can you go and where is it to, it's a narrow, it's a narrow margin again. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is nodding. Yes. Um, it's a bit tangential, but you mentioned there's a quote that the first 25 years are crucial. That's what uh, Eric Scherer says. Yes. Yeah, it seemed like a lot of years. Just a lot of years. Yes. Well, why? Why so many years? Oh, you'll have to ask him. I I don't know. Something with the brain is. I think it's 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 at your twenty at your twenty fifth. You're probably at the height of your. Uh, brain possibilities. 
I'm a bit older. <laughs> so um, probably it has to do with that. So yeah. But I was really astonished that it's scientifically proved that art stimulates in that way the synapses and that you build another brain with when you go and see art, whether it's theater or expositions or music concerts. The range is much bigger than only theater, of course. Yeah, that's amazing, actually. And so he says he's really a report about uh, elderly diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia in general, that it really helps. It's not a guarantee, but it helps. It, you get it later, so that's what he has to say. <laughs> you get it, but you get it later. <laughs> so other questions? No? I want yes. to ask. Yes. Um, from the three examples, like one of them was a little, little red riding hood, quite mm -hmm. a standard story, and above the other ones were more futuristic yes, uh, exactly. stories. Yeah. Is it easier to use new, technologi te new technologies in futuristic stories than in like normal stories in, in general? What do you mm -hmm. think is the tendency mm -hmm. in the, in the future? Yeah, I think it's more logical when you work with the futuristic imaginative, like yours did, or, or Leah Jacobs and, and Ken Pistar, the two young uh, makers of the last performance. Um, it's quite evident that you use, like, but in a way, that I had a bit of a problem with the title of this <laughs> lecture because cameras are so embedded in every performance now, so it's, we, we even forget that it's like a kind of technology, like glasses or, or uh, uh, hearing aids. Or, um, so yeah, I think yours was very clear. I want to work with the, fl I asked also already him, for, let's do something with the futuristic since he's, he's I don't know if you know him, he's a, quite a famous author. Uh, now and he's always working into the, the unknown and the futuristic kind of touch. So I really wanted to work with him because he had that kind of, of flow in his work. So, and he was immediately said like, I want to work with this and that and that, and it involved, included cameras and, and everything else. Yeah. So, but the use of camera also, but it, that will be bring us too far, but we can also discuss later on, is also a bit of, not always that evident I think in theater, because I want to stress also in every show I showed you there was Fierce live acting, of course, because that's still the basis. The technology is sort of helping us, but it's not the subject as such. But the lecture was a bit intended to to take away some fears about using technology <laughs> in the theater, because there's a lot of like what I said, troll, <coughs> skin poetry. Let's not do it. But if used in uh, in an interesting way, I hope, then then it can really work. I think if you try to make it's the same accounts for puppets, I think. Which, with each performance, we try to ask ourselves, do we really need these puppets for this kind of uh, content? So we always start from a content and then see what means are, are, are necessary. For instance, if you make a, a performance about cloning, of course, the use of, of puppets could be wonderful. That's, that's, then you make it really a necessity, besides a, a thousand other ways to, to do that. Uh, in Shakespeare times, they always said, oh, we're in the woods now. And then people say, text, text decor, they say. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's how you deal with things, of course. But I, I find it fascinating, and I always find it a, an extra value also, because these, these young children, they are always fascinated by how, how do they do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that much they, that they forget the content, so we always have to discuss after the performance half an hour about what's the right uh, uh, weight you give to the, to the things you, it means you bring to the, the performance. But yeah, it, it works like hell, actually. The, the, the Planet Nibani was really like, it's a, in the beginning it was difficult to, to get it spread, but now it's like a big, a big success because it's like it touches something that they, they live with. So, And the interesting thing is that the perspective is reversed. So the, it's actually aliens who talk about humans, and humans are naked puppets. So that's also a bit of a, a strange thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. There was one child who cried like, because in the first they come up and then they have an introduction, and then they uh, they show the first uh, puppet. So they, they take away his kind of uh, what do you call it the blanket, and it, there's this naked puppet, which is beautiful because because of the nakedness, it, it, it has a vulnerability to humankind actually. And so this one child said, "I'm on a porno show now." <laughs> so <laughs> he was kind of <gasps> a naked puppet. But that's also an, a thing. They forget it after a minute, they're, they're completely forgotten. You can't put, of course, or it's difficult to put naked people live on stage, but you can't do that. You can do that with puppets. So again, that's another necessity you can try to, to find when using puppets. And mm. It always has to have a reason, I think. Uh, and not a logical reason, but a, a reason forced by the imaginative uh, on stage, I think. Okay. 
Other questions? Or we want to have a coffee in the morning? Okay. Thank you very much.